What's up guys, Dr. Gooden, and I'm back. After a long hiatus, it is time to get back to work studying for the CSCS certification. This video, we're talking about age and sex related differences and implications for resistance training. This will be covered in three parts. This is part one, and if you stay tuned until the end, we will take a look at an annual plan, actually a multi-annual plan for training children from the very earliest ages all the way into their late adolescence. So stay tuned for that. This will be kids and resistance training. All right, guys, it is good to be back with you. I'm excited to continue working through the textbook Essentials of Strength Training and Conditioning. So we're going to dive right into the chapter seven. This was written by doctors Lloyd and Fagenbaum, both of whom are experts in youth resistance training and special populations training. I've actually heard Dr. Fagenbaum speak. He's very entertaining, very engaging guy, uh, tons of experience and research. So this is an awesome chapter. Let's dive right into it. Now the chapter objectives are to uh, do four things. First, we're gonna evaluate evidence regarding the safety and effectiveness and importance of resistance training for children. Then we're gonna look at sex-related differences. That will be in a second video. So this first video is just about the kids. Uh, then we're gonna describe the effects of aging on the musculoskeletal system and why we should uh, train our older adults with resistance training. Uh, it's never too late to get into strength training or to continue strength training. We'll see that um, in the third video. And then also throughout, we'll be explaining why adaptations to resistance training can vary greatly among these three distinct populations. Okay, so it's gonna be in three parts. This is part one, dealing with the kiddos. Should kids resistance train? Yes or no? And if so, how should we train them in a safe and effective manner? So in the last one or two decades, I would say that we are making progress in dispelling the myth that resistance training is bad for kids. Now we're gonna cover some of those myths, for instance, that it can uh, damage growth plates and stunt growth, et cetera. Uh, but in the last decade or two, we've been seeing that it is an important component of sport preparedness for these kids. So it's important for strength and conditioning professionals to understand the fundamental principles of growth, maturation, and development, because you're not going to train a kid like you're going to train an adult. So the first thing we have to distinguish between, the first concept is biological versus chronological age. Chronological age is the typical age that we use to denote how old somebody is, like in terms of days, months, or years, right? So I'm currently 32 years old, but my training age and my biological age are both going to be different than my chronological age, which is 32. Uh, kids love to spout out their chronological age. You know, I'm seven, almost eight. Uh, I'm seven and a half, seven and three quarters, but their biological age may be uh, different than their same chronological age peers. Now some milestones, or one of the milestones in, uh, in biological age is puberty. And this refers to a period of time in which the secondary sex char characteristics develop and that kid is transformed into a little adult. Now maybe the brain power isn't quite there, the reasoning and the logic isn't there, but their body starts to morph from sort of an asexual uh, kid, right? They don't have secondary sex characteristics yet into a fully fledged adult. Now, it's really during puberty that we see big changes in body composition and in the ca capability of performance of physical skills. Now, it's really important to understand that kids don't grow at a constant rate. You can never expect them to have linear improvement from age four to five, five to six, six to seven, and so on down the line. It's not constant, it's not linear, and there are substantial inter-individual differences in the physical development at any chronological age. Now here is a graph showing DNA methylation of a whole bunch of individuals, and these are adults, okay? These aren't kids, but I just wanted to, to make a point with this. DNA methylation is one way of uh, quantifying biological age, and we can see here that the more methylation, as DNA methylation goes up, uh, the biological age uh, goes up as well. So more is, well, we'll say it's worse if we, if we consider aging and getting older to be worse. Now, we know that 
There are a lot of beautiful things that happen as you age, as you ripen, so to speak. But in this case, uh, younger is going to be better. And so we see here, these two individuals, both of them have the same chronological age, uh, but one has a biological age based on his methylation, very low methylation of 32. And the other, based on his very high levels of DNA methylation in the cells, is 65. So one individual is 32, one is 65, based on biological age, but they are both the same chronological 45, right? And so you, you can see those people who, it looks like they age faster than others, or maybe they age more slowly and they, they always have this sort of youthful vigor. Well, DNA methylation is one way to measure that. And this is just to illustrate the point that your chronological age can be the same as somebody else, but due to both genetic um, or hereditary factors and lifestyle factors, you could be a vastly different biological age. Now in children, we know that muscle and bone growth is important. Um, and we also know that obviously muscle mass steadily increases throughout the developing years. But again, it's not going to be linear. It's really during puberty that uh, increases in testosterone production in boys result in a marked increase in muscle mass. But in girls, an increase in estrogen, so girls and estrogen, uh, it increases body fat uh, deposition, breast development, and the widening of hips. So there are two very distinct, very different sets of adaptations going on at puberty for boys and for girls. And this is really where we start to see a really uh, differentiation in performance abilities. It's not until puberty that oftentimes boys and girls need to necessarily be separated in sport because they're pretty similar until they go in those diverging directions where boys get more muscle mass and girls uh, have the widening of hips and the taking on of more uh, body fat and change in body composition. This is also when the epiphyseal plate becomes ossified and the long bones stop growing. We're gonna take a look at that here in a second. So here is the bone formation, just kind of roughly in three stages of a long bone. This could be a humerus, this could be a femur. When the child is a fetus, when they're in development, it's mostly cartilage, right? And there's not a lot of ossification happening. Now, as the child is growing, we see this zone down here, we would call this the growth plate or the epiphyseal plate where the bone is actually lengthening. This is where the bone's getting its length. And as long as that is not ossified, uh, the bone will continue growing longer. Now the fear then is that before the child becomes an adult, there, there's this myth that resistance training can cause a premature ossification or maybe even fracture of the growth plates. Now, in reality, this is unsubstantiated and, and we'll take a look at that here in a second. Now the key point though to understand about growth cartilage is that it's found in three areas, the epiphyseal plate, the joint surface, and the apophyseal insertions. Now damage to this cartilage may impair the growth and development of that bone. But this risk can be reduced with appropriate exercise technique, with sens sensible progressions, and with uh, the instruction of a qualified strength and conditioning coach. So, you know, all of you, once you have your CSCS certification. Honestly, if you approach the training of a child in the same measured, calculated, slow, slowly progressing way that you would an adult, but making allowances for this kid's level of development, you're probably going to be fine. Not then, three. Okay, drive. Good job. Two. Poopy, there, I nice did Nice job, drop it. Any poopoo. Any poopoo. Good. So really we just wanna follow the guidelines that are set out in this chapter and be cautious when adding load. And really we want to first address technique and then address movement quality and movement velocity before we add any load, right? So it's positions first, then movement, then velocity of movement, and then we can maybe safely add some load. But the goal is never to max out or to take huge jumps but because for kids, they're always growing. So it's not like you know, you're gonna hit some big PR and yay, that's a big accomplishment. The kid's just gonna grow the next year and be able to uh, you know, lift a little bit more. So instead of chasing PRs, we chase uh, good, good quality movement and we chase injury-free fun training. Now here are some different types of growth plate fractures. You don't necessarily need to know this for the CSCS, I just wanted to uh, show this picture, right? So here, here's the growth plate and you can have a fracture through the growth plate, uh, across the growth plate, or you know, up through 
the growth plate through the um, epiphysis, kind of straight down through, and then a compression fracture. There's a lot of different ways of fracturing it. I think most likely, and this isn't research, so double check this for me. I think most likely, if there's a risk of fracturing your growth plate with, with weight training, uh, people fear a compression fracture. But again, in reality, with sensible loading, that just doesn't happen. Now here is a graph showing peak height velocity in girls and in boys. And this is important for the next point we're going to make. So we see that the, the shape of the graph looks the same. So we start off in both cases with a very rapid changes in height, and then it diminishes to this sort of plateau, and then it shoots up again at puberty, but it happens in females much earlier, so t maybe 12 or 13 than in males, where it happens more like 14 and 15. And this is why in middle school, at a middle school dance, if you see uh, kids dancing, if they, if anyone's brave enough to dance at a middle school dance, you're gonna see the girls are almost always taller than the boys because they are hitting their you know, second peak height velocity uh, and the boys are yet to hit that. Usually that's uh, early high school, sometimes even later high school for those uh, later to mature individuals. Okay, now in this graph, we're looking at a slightly different concept. We're looking at chronological age here on the x-axis and then biological maturation here on the secondary y-axis. And what we can see is the difference between early and late maturing individuals. So this first dotted line that we see, these are early maturing uh, girls, no, sorry, boys, that's on the left. And then here in this dotted line, that's late maturing boys. On the right side, we have early maturing girls and then late maturing girls. And notice that early maturing uh, girls can start maturing right around nine or 10. So that's, you know, that's pretty darn early. So you can have some girls going through puberty at 10 and maybe some uh, boys that you might be training not going through puberty until they're 16, right? So there's like a vast, vast inter-individual difference in the biological age of children that you may be training. So it's really important not to base things on children's age. Yes, we can have loose age buckets uh, or brackets, but really, if you really want to individually tailor a program to a child, you have to uh, look at their biological age markers. Now, the muscular strength changes in boys, peak gains in strength typically occur about 1.2 years after peak height velocity. So remember, that's right around 14 to 15 in that peak height velocity. So really 15, 16, 17 is where we get the greatest increases uh, in strength. And it will be 0.8 years after peak weight velocity. So peak weight velocity tends to be maybe about a half a year or so behind peak height velocity. Now in girls, peak gains in strength also occur after peak height velocity but there's more individual variation. Uh, and this is due to the fact that at puberty, it's, girls don't gain a whole ton of muscle. They're gaining uh, body fat, changes in body composition, and changes kind of in their structure, so widening of hips, et cetera. So they're not directly getting all this muscle mass like uh, boys are because of the testosterone that the boys get during puberty. On average, in women, peak strength is attained by age 20, and for men, it's between 20 and 30. But this is for untrained individuals, right? So an untrained woman, a woman who's never gonna touch a weight in her life, she, gain, she attains her peak strength at 20. But we know with training, obviously, you can uh, maintain and improve that for decades to come, and the same thing with men. So now that we've covered the differences between biological and chronological age, we've looked at peak height velocity, peak weight velocity, and when uh, muscle and strength tend to peak uh, right after the peak uh, weight velocity and height velocity. Now we can get into is, is weight training recommended for kids? And the leading researchers in this topic, so doctors uh, Fagenbaum and Lloyd and Oliver, they all agree, yes, it is, uh, it's foundational for the long-term athletic development of kids, but also just for the long-term health and well-being of kids to engage in some form of general resistance training. Uh, so we, you know, we can take a look at various research. I recommend this paper, The Youth Physical Development Model, A New Approach to Long-Term Athletic Development with Drs. Lloyd and Oliver. Uh, it's a great read. If you train kids, you know, read this. Uh, send it to parents who are skeptical about resistance training uh, because it really does a really good job of summarizing the literature and really laying out a path forward. 
Now, as far as responsiveness to training goes, we've seen gains of roughly 30 to 40% in untrained pre-adolescent children, so that's, remember, before puberty, uh, with short-term resistance training programs, so 8 to 20 weeks. I mean, that's massive gains in strength, 30 to 40%. That's really cool. Uh, that's really fast gains. Imagine the utility of increasing your ability to move other objects by 40%. That's massive. Imagine, you know, imagine now this kid handling their own like small body weight with that uh, increase in strength. Now, unfortunately, data also suggests that these strength values do return to, this, to the uh, pre-training values once children stop weight training or strength training. So that's unfortunate, but it just uh, goes to show that we should be engaging our children, our, our young athletes, in some form of strength work all year long. It doesn't mean they have to have some sort of rigorous, crazy program, but you know, let's get them in some sort of consistent strength activity. It doesn't have to be weight training. What about gymnastics? What about a martial art? What about tumbling? What about, uh, what about parkour? You know, mixing it up, these, these types of activities that can overload various aspects of the musculoskeletal uh, neural system so that they can continue to make these gains. So the key point here is that pre-adolescent boys and girls can significantly improve their strength above and beyond what normal growth and maturation would impart them uh, with resistance training. Now, this is primarily through neurological factors as opposed to hypertrophic factors. Because remember, there's very little testosterone coursing through these little pre-adolescent kids. So most of the gains are not going to be from muscle size, increased uh, you know, contractile components in the muscle. It's going to be from neurological adaptations. So here we see a graph showing four key components of uh, strength development, four key factors. Now notice that the thing that peaks earliest, the factor that peaks the earliest, is the neural myelination development. So these, these neural adaptations, remember that myelination, a myelinated nerve sends signals faster. And a faster signal from the alpha motor neuron is going to mean a quicker um, development of force, right? Greater uh, rates of force development. Greater rates of force development um, are a neural adaptation to strength training. So if we can harness that uh, neural myelination development with resistance training and augment it, that's where we get uh, massive gains in strength for these young kids. Notice that androgenic hormones, they stay very low until we hit puberty and go into adolescence. Uh, theoretical fiber type differentiation, this is theoretical because we don't take muscle biopsies of our kids uh, very often or ever, I don't think. Um, so in theory, we see some muscle fiber type differentiation occurring uh, somewhat quickly and then tapering off in pre-adolescence. Now this could be important because if you send those kids out for a ton of slow miles around a track at a steady pace, when their fiber types and the myelination of their nerves are developing, well, what types of fibers do you think you're going to be predisposing your kids to if they're always doing some sort of long, slow distance? Mm, probably slow twitch, type one, you know, less myelination on the nerves. And, and this is just me maybe taking these to logical conclusions, not necessarily speaking to the research, but I think we should harness this, uh, this period and really let the kids train how they play. If you watch a kid on the playground, they don't just go at a steady pace that doesn't change. They sprint really fast and then they just stop or flop on the ground or catch their breath or stand around and you know play. And then suddenly they see their friend and they sprint again. They're doing repetitive sprints with rests in between. So maybe our training of kids should look something like how they already play. And then finally, lean body mass. We see it increase quickly uh, from infancy, but then it sort of almost levels out before increasing again at puberty. Now here is just a reminder from uh, Zamparo and Stone and colleagues about what, uh, what factors are affecting maximum strength and then also power. And so we can see that of course there's going to be changes in cross-sectional area, muscle mass, muscle architecture, but remember this is not what we're really influencing in our kids when, when we are resistance training them. It's really going to be these central and local factors, recruitment, Maybe some fiber type shifting, maybe more like fiber type development and differentiation as the kid is growing. Uh, Co-contraction alteration, so um, inter and intramuscular uh, contraction strategies, training those early is really important. And then to develop power, these are going to be uh, task specific coordination of multiple joints, 
movement patterns, etc. So it's those two sets of factors that we can really influence in our kids until they hit puberty. And then right around puberty and after, now we can maybe start focusing a little bit more on increasing muscle mass, cross-sectional area, et cetera. So potential benefits of strength training, participation in a resistance training program. Uh, it, well, we, we know that it can influence many health and fitness related measures. Health and fitness are by far more important than sport performance for our kids. Really, we just want them to live healthy, strong uh, lives, free from any type of uh, movement deficiencies, and strength training can really help them do that. Potential risks and concerns, well, really there are none if we are prescribing good programs that pay attention to cautious overload that are specific to our kids' biological uh, level of maturation, and if it's overseen by a well-qualified strength and conditioning coach, who cares about the kids, right? Who cares about them as individuals? Uh, some design considerations for kids. Uh, well, well, we want to consider the quality of instruction and the rate of progression. This is not a time to give the kids just, you know, an Excel sheet and say, okay, do these exercises. Uh, we want to give them really good quality instruction. Get in there with those kids, face-to-face, uh, -face, laughing with them, joking with them, instilling uh, good discipline in them, progressing them slowly and methodically and intentionally from one movement to the next to the next, from lighter loads to slightly heavier loads, etc., from slower velocities to faster velocities. We want to be intentional about every part of that progression. And we focus on skill improvement, like I said earlier, movement technique, hitting positions, uh, personal successes. So we're not going for these absolute benchmarks. We're going for what did the kid do last time and you know, can he maybe better it slightly this time? Or maybe can she hit those process goals and reward them for the process goals uh, like showing up or being consistent or, or doing all of her reps or um, I don't know, having a, good, having a good attitude during training or encouraging her teammates. And then uh, most important for the kids is having fun, right? We, d we cannot uh, guilt trip kids. We can't uh, be authoritarian towards them. We can't say, you know, if you don't do this and you're not going to succeed in this way, that doesn't motivate kids. What does motivate them is laughter or a goal or maybe a friendly competition with their friends. Uh, so it's, it, it can be a very, very fun training environment. Some really great ways to reduce overuse in injuries. Uh, well, young kids should be evaluated by a physician. That's super important. We want to screen for all kinds of uh, under the surface potential conditions that, that could be potentially life-threatening to kids. So get them their physicals. Uh, we want parents to be educated about the benefits and the risks of competitive sports. You know what's more uh, dangerous than resistance training? Uh, it's potentially peewee football without teaching the kids how to properly tackle or how to uh, you know, properly, properly take a tackle or putting the kid into year-round baseball and having them throw you know, a thousand pitches a month or something like that without any respite from that or without any kind of general reset period in their season. So uh, we want to educate parents. We also want to educate the parents on the importance of preparatory conditioning. We, we need to prepare the kids to play the sport, right? Uh, the, the preparatory conditioning is general training, it's non-sport specific, it's fun, it's varied, it's multi-directional, it's um, multiple kinds of implements, and the parents need to understand the importance of that. And then we want to encourage kids to participate in year-round activity. Remember that they regress back towards the average as soon as they, not as soon as they stop, but uh, in a matter of weeks or months after they stop activity, they're going to go right back down to the average. So we want to maintain that uh, momentum of training. Also, we need well-planned and implemented recovery strategies. So do they have off days? Do they have off weeks? Do they have off seasons where they do a different sport or a different activity? Nutritional status. Uh, one of my friends told me uh, as adults, he said, yeah, my mom used to make me sugar-free Gatorade with electrolytes. And I was like, your mom was doing you a disservice. She had great intentions. But uh, you needed to replenish that glucose when you were playing the back-to-back -back soccer matches at that tournament. Okay, now what about program design considerations for children? Uh, we want to teach children to understand the benefits and the risks associated with resistance training. So usually uh, what I do is from day one, uh, we talk about expectations, right? You're expected to show up with proper attire. You are expected to spot your teammates or your, or your, um, you know, your training buddy. 
you are expected to pay attention when the coach is talking, right? When I'm talking, you're quiet. And of course, we say these things uh, in a friendly way, in a nice way, it's not authoritarian, but uh, we do have to set those expectations. You are expected to uh, reduce the load. If I say, hey, let's reduce the load. Um, all of these things are important. Uh, but then also understanding the benefits, right? So here is how resistance training will impact your future sport performance. Uh, but not only that, your health and your fitness and your enjoyment of life. Here's, here's what can happen if you become stronger, if you, if you become more agile or more powerful through this activity. Kids love to see personal improvement. We need competent and caring uh, fitness professionals to supervise the training sessions. Right, and I'll say, I'll say this again, it's not a time to just throw down a program in front of a kid and say, go do it, or to say, like, you know, give me another uh, set of squats. Like, that's, that doesn't work. We need to motivate them uh, intrinsically, teach them to be intrinsically motivated, but also have some extrinsically motivated fun when we're training these kids. And then also sometimes you just need to give a listening ear to kids and, and you know, be there for them. Uh, the exercise environment should be free and safe from hazards. So, you know, I get this all the time when, I, when my kids are down here in the gym and they're wanting to, you know, have a little training session with daddy. And when all three of them are down here, it can be a little bit chaotic. I need to make sure that the floor is clean, that there's no toys or like bikes in the middle of the platform, uh, that equipment is all to the side. So they have, you know, rooms kind of move, to move around. Kids move a lot. The equipment should obviously be in good repair. Uh, and also we want dynamic warm-up exercises. So the warm-up is really a great place to start teaching children movement strategies to get them the kinesthetic awareness and the proprioception that they need to be developing. It's a time for fun games, for kind of icebreakers. Okay, now so the, so the textbook sort of ends the chapter with, uh, or at least ends this section with a bunch of youth uh, resistance training guidelines. Now these are just guidelines, they may not all fit, for your unique situation when working with kids. Maybe you have a huge group, maybe you have a small group of two. Maybe you have a very, very gifted individual. Maybe you have a not so gifted individual, right? And so these guidelines are just that, they're guidelines. They're not, they're not necessarily uh, laws. So static stretching should be performed after resist resistance training, right? Uh, there's some pretty good research showing that maybe resistance training lowers power outputs but may also predispose us to, to injury. It's a great thing to do after the session is over as part of a cool down. We wanna carefully monitor the child's tolerance to exercise stress. You know, some kids, they do a set of 10 air squats and that like just about kills them. <laughs> Other kids, they can keep on, you know, doing set after set after set of of whatever the movement is, and it seems like they're, you know, they have a huge engine, they can just keep going. We always want to begin with light loads. It's very tempting for some kids to see the big heavy weights and they say, you know, I want to do more, I want to do more. My daughter is that way. She's always asking me, you know, Daddy, can I can I deadlift 50 pounds today? I'm like, no, honey, let's let's stick with you know whatever the load was last week and let's do let's work up to five sets instead of four sets. Uh, so some kids always want to push it. Other kids are afraid to push it, and maybe you have to uh, you know, help them to, to work up the courage to hit a new load that you know that they're, they're capable of. Uh, we want to increase resistance very gradually, uh, depending on the needs of, or the goals. Really, one to three sets of six to 15 reps uh, on a variety of exercises can be performed. These are, again, just guidelines. For instance, with my kids, we do a lot of sets of five because I think five is great to teach new movements. It's not enough to really over fatigue you, but it's enough uh, repetition to really lock in that movement pattern. Now more advanced multi-joint exercises, you might be a little bit hesitant to incorporate those with kids, but as long as the focus is on technique and you teach them from the ground up and you progress them with movements that sort of force them into the right positions, like you know starting with a goblet squat and uh, maybe even a pause goblet squat and then going to a normal goblet squat and then going to a front squat and then to a back squat. Right, progressing naturally from these movements that force them into good positions, of course, we can perform these multi-joint exercises with kids and even the Olympic lifts. Ta-da! Uh, really two or three non-consecutive training sessions per week is what is recommended. Of course, they could probably train more, but do they need to train more? Are there other activities that they could do, like, I don't know, their homework or maybe a different sport or something like that? Uh, we always want adult spotters 
nearby because you never know with kids, right? They could get a weight on their back that they've done a hundred times and then suddenly their nose itches and they let go and they try to itch their nose or they hear a sound of their friend and they turn with the bar on their back and they're like, oh, hey, it's, you know, it's Sally and they turn and, and you could get into those types of situ situations. So you always have to have your head on a swivel when training kids. Hey Jack, can you back up two steps? Hey, hey, hey. And the program should be systematically varied throughout the year, of course, right? We want to periodize these programs. And even if you can't quite periodize, because they always have a different sport going on, perhaps, uh, at least some sort of systematic variation is better than static, sort of, you know, steady training. Now, okay, here is the point where we get to that youth physical development model uh, put together by, I think it was Drs. Lloyd and Oliver, uh, this one's for females, and we can see, right, chronological age across the top, going this way, and then down here, down the y-axis, we have these uh, different sort of categories, right? So age periods is first, early childhood, all the way to adulthood, the growth rate, remember the peak height velocity chart, so rapid growth and steady growth and adolescent spurt, etc. The maturational status, so this is biological age we're talking about, and then training adaptation. So first, remember, we want primary, uh, predominantly neural adaptations. That's, that's what the kids are going to be adapting with, is with the neuromuscular system. But then, once we get into uh, peak height velocity, now we have a combination of neural and hormonal adaptations, with, which can drive that muscular growth as well. Not so much for females, but definitely for males. But the larger the font, the more focus we should be placing on this physical quality. And notice that strength is the only physical quality that is you know, large and in bold the whole way through from two years old to 21 plus. We want strength of focus the whole time. Notice that agility, we don't really start focusing on it until middle childhood and then in adolescence. Same thing with speed and power. But uh, one, of, one of the key things I wanna highlight is that hypertrophy over here, you can't really see here, I'm circling it. Hypertrophy, we should not focus on hypertrophy until the kids have hit puberty and right after puberty, right? So right at peak height velocity and then after is when we need to, uh, is when we can have some uh, mesocycles focused on hypertrophy for these kids because really focusing on it earlier is not going to do them much good because the only adaptations they are making are neural in nature, not muscular. And here it is for boys, largely the same except for we have this, um, this sort of differentiation between uh, middle childhood and adolescence, it happens a couple years later than uh, with the girls. Okay, so this is a youth uh, physical development model. Use this when you're planning the long-term development of kids, especially if you can have them for multiple years. Like if you're a PE teacher or if you are a middle school coach or a high school, uh, high school coach or PE teacher, you know, plaster this on the wall so that you can understand, you can say, okay, here are my priorities for training these kids. It doesn't mean that if your, your priority is strength, you're always just hammering you know, sets of three to five on the back squat or the bench press. But uh, it does mean that you want strength-focused training sessions with a variety of movements, with a variety of learning opportunities for these kids That's, that, um, that will be driving adaptations for stronger, more resilient organisms as they play their sports. Continue going through chapter seven with me. The next video, which will appear somewhere on the screen, is going to be about sex-related differences. I promise it will be shorter than this video. We had a lot to cover. But sex-related differences, uh, should we train men and women differently? Uh, find out in the next video. All right, guys, don't forget to subscribe uh, and give this a like if you're getting any value from this. I'm Dr. Gooden, and I'll see you on the next video. Do three more. No. Do three more, then you get a protein shake.